انتهي من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي So this topic, um, you know, the idea here is that we, we like to um, almost deify our heroes. We, we are obsessed with being superheroes and having superpowers. But so what we've done is we've taken our heroes, our real heroes, not the fake fictional ones, uh, but we've taken our real heroes and we've tried to do the same thing to them. We've tried to turn them into superhuman. We don't want to accept our own humanity And so what we want to do is, if someone is a hero to us, we want to somehow make them superhuman. We can't accept that someone can be a human being and still be our hero and be someone who is of utmost uh, you know, excellent character. And so there's this tendency that I've seen in our community to, to almost try to take the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and turn him into something superhuman. And I think this is a flaw that we have as human beings. And it's not, it's not, only, it's not only us that do this. But in fact, you know, from the beginning of, we, we're told in the Quran that the people in the past used to do this too. They used to say to their prophets, but you're only human, right? It was like this idea that so long as they were human like them, they couldn't be prophets. There was this idea that to be a prophet, you have to be superhuman. You have to be um, an angel. And so there was this, they had trouble accepting these prophets, peace be upon them all. Why? Because they walked like them, they talked like them, they ate like them, they married like them. They couldn't accept that that someone could be a prophet and still be a human being. And so I think it's so important that we understand, and this is actually very interesting because we also do this to our leaders. We also do this even to our, uh, you know, our, um, our shiuch. We do this to our teachers. Is that in a sense, we put them up in a pedestal and make them superhuman. We, we, we can't think that they would have flaws. We, we almost think of them as, and, and this is something that we find, is that we don't think that they have human lives, you know, they have, they have uh, flaws, they, have, they will make mistakes. It's like, again, this idea of putting someone that we respect and someone that we admire, we tend to try to put them at a higher level or like a pedestal. And this can be very dangerous. This was something we're warned about in the Quran, uh, that this is what we should not do to the Prophet Sallallahu as some others did in the past with their prophets. And so what I want to begin with is, how is it that we should view the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And how is it that we can connect to him? So I was thinking about what, what parts of his life really, really inspire me and really inspire me uh, from, from, from a human level. And so I thought of two things, and I want to just share those two with you. And, um, and, and, and the reason is that it is, it's such a beautiful example of how someone can live in this life and yet still be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is one of the hardest things that we find, right? When someone wants to be very spiritual, for example... Often we see that if someone wants to be very spiritual, there is sort of like a practice of, you know, moving away from the world, right? Going off the, the idea of, of being um, an aesthetic and the idea of what does it mean to detach oneself from dunya? Does detaching oneself from this life mean that I pull off, you know, and I live in a cave, I don't get involved with the community, I don't get married... And so it's very, it's very important because Islam came with this balance. It gave us the opportunity to live in dunya, to, to, to be involved in dunya, to be involved in the mundane, and still be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the epitome of this example is in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So the two examples that, that, that came to me uh, that are very, very special to me, one is the example of what happened when Aisha radiallahu anha was being accused. And we know the story of when Aisha radiallahu anha was being accused of being unchaste, and then how it was such a trial uh, you know, for the Prophet and for the family. And 
these two examples that I'm going to give are two of the most difficult times in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, and, and, and so this is when his wife is being accused. And at this point, it was before the revelation had come, uh, exonerating her, right? Approving her innocence. And what really struck me is what was his response? Okay, if you can imagine yourself in this position, uh, and, and, and what would your response be if, if, if people are accusing your spouse of something like this? But look at what his response was. His response was, he went to her and he said that if you are innocent, it will be proven. And if you have committed this, then, and this is the part I want you to focus on, if you have committed this, meaning you have actually done this, Look what his focus was. His focus wasn't, how could you do this to me? His focus was, you're such a terrible person if you did this. Your, his focus wasn't, you know, to, to, to shame her or to attack her. You know what his focus was? If you did this, then repent to Allah. So his focus for her wasn't his own ego. It wasn't his own rights that she would have, you know, if somebody does that to their spouse, they are overstepping the rights of the spouse. But that wasn't his focus. His focus wasn't his own rights, his own ego. His, his, his focus was her relationship with God, her relationship with her creator. If even if you did do this, then just, you know, make it right with God. And so his, his, his biggest concern right then, when he didn't know, was her relationship with her creator. And I just, I found that amazing. I found that absolutely amazing that the Prophet ﷺ loved her in such a pure way that it was about, it wasn't about him and, 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 and how he appeared. You know, like a lot of us put in that situation, um, you know, we'd feel like, how could you do this to me and my reputation, right? How could you dishonor me? It, a lot of us naturally would think of ourselves, right? We think of what it meant for me, what it meant for how people are going to look at us and, and what are people going to say, right? What are people going to say about my wife? What are going to, you've dishonored the family, right? This type of thinking, whether, you know, it's the daughter or it's the wife, but he's not even thinking like that. He's asking, he's telling her, just make it right with God because his concern was about her hereafter, his concern wasn't about what people are going to say and the fact that he was going to be dishonored. And so I, thought, I just found that so inspiring. The other example was a time when the Prophet ﷺ was at his most difficult, painful period of his entire life. And this came after the death of his beloved wife. And then shortly, in, you know, within the same time period, he also lost his uncle. And these were two of the most beloved people to the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And not only were they among the most beloved, but they were also among his greatest supporters. So two of his greatest supporters were taken at like around the same time. And that's why this year was called Am al Husn. It was the year of sadness where he lost Khadija anha, and his uncle in the same period. Now, after going through this tragic loss, he goes to Ta'if. And when he goes to Ta'if, he's going there to get support. He's going there, you know, to, to be, during a time which is very difficult, looking for someone who will support him. And when he gets there, as you know the story, he was treated so badly, and he was thrown out of the city, and he was pelted with stones to the extent that he was made to bleed. And the Prophet ﷺ, this type of treatment was given to him at a time when he was already grieving. So if you can imagine what, where he was at this point. And then he left, and this is what I want you to focus on. So this is a, a man who has just lost his beloved wife and has just lost his beloved uncle who raised him and took care of him and protected him and supported him. And now he's been treated in this way where he came to this, 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 he came with in, in peace to these people and this is how they treated him. So at this point, he makes a really profound dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I advise everyone to look up this dua, the dua of Ta'if. It's so powerful. 
But there's a couple reflections I just want to make about this dua. Very inspiring. First of all, at this point, what was the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's reaction? See, a lot of times when we're put in a situation where things, you know when they say, um, when it rains, it pours. Has that ever happened to you in your life? A point in your life where it's like one thing goes wrong, but then everything goes wrong, and it feels like everything just keeps on going wrong. One loss after another. So at this point, it's one thing after another. How does he respond? Is he angry? Is he angry at the people? Is he angry at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, you're going to see. First, he calls out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and listen to what he says. He complains, and I want to I wanna emphasize this here. Usually when things go tough for us, we complain about that which is causing it, right? Sometimes we even go to the extent of blaming God. How could you do this to me? Why me? It's not fair, right? Sometimes we react this way and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for protection from that type of reaction. But the Prophet ﷺ at this point, he says, I complain to you. Who's he complaining about? He says, I complain to you about my own weakness, about my own inability. In other words, he's complaining to Allah about the fact that he's only human. And the fact that he, that his own inabilities, he's not complaining about Allah. He's turning to Allah about himself. He's humbling himself. And then, and this is the other part I really want to focus on. He calls out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this point, And he says that if you are not angry with me, then I don't mind. He says, if you are not angry with me, then I don't mind. So, you see again his focus. And the reason I brought up these stories is because I want you to understand and reflect on the focus of the Prophet Sallallahu heart, right? With Aisha radiallahu anha, his, the focus of his heart was what? Allah and her relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It wasn't the people. It wasn't what are they going to say. It wasn't how is this going to appear on me? How is this going to look on me? And then here... His focus again is on Allah. He says, if you are not angry with me, even though he had been through so much trial at this point, right? In fact, later on when he was asked, what was the hardest part in your, what was the hardest time in your life? He said it was that time, the time of Taif. So this was a man who was tested again and again and again. He went through torture, his people were tortured, they were starved, they were boycotted, and that he's saying this was the hardest time in his life. So you have to understand where he's at, psychologically and emotionally, and yet his focus is still, is Allah pleased with him? He said, if you are not displeased with me, then I don't mind. And now, the angel comes to him, and the angel asks him, just say the word, and we will take these two mountains and destroy these people who have just treated you in this way. He's a prophet. And he says to that angel, so now look, again, he didn't have anger towards Allah. In fact, his concern was just, is Allah angry with me? As long as Allah is not displeased with me, then I don't mind. But he didn't even have anger towards the people. He was given an opportunity for just justice really just revenge and he was given that opportunity and it would have been fair because he's a prophet this is an angel and the angel said i can take these two just say the word and i will crush th these people can be ob obliterated bring the two mountains together and you know what he said he said no because even if they don't believe there may come from their progeny a people who will believe. And that's exactly what happened. And now we have in Ta'if Muslims. There, that is indeed what happened. And it was because the Prophet Sallallahu his focus was on Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And because of that, he didn't get consumed with his own, you know, this human feeling of I want revenge. Or these, these things that we get caught up in, in terms of our ego. Now, we might look at that and say, 
That's the Prophet ﷺ. But what is it about the Prophet ﷺ that we're supposed to emulate? And what is it that we can learn from this? How can we apply this in our own lives? That's really the question, and that's the take home. And really, here's what it comes down to. The heart is a thing that whatever you focus on, whatever your heart focuses on, grows in your life. So if you're a person who focuses on your image, how you appear in front of people, your ego, your pride, then that becomes the most important thing. It will grow. If you're a person who focuses on what do other people think, what are other people saying about me? What are other people, um, you know, doing and, and tr how are other people perceiving me? Am I being approved of? Am I being, if that becomes your focus and your, your obsession is on what other people think and what other people say, then that's going to become more and more significant in your life. What you focus on grows. And here's the thing about human beings and the way that the heart works is that Whatever we love most in our lives, so just take a moment, think about, okay, what do I love most? Everyone loves something, but what do we love most? And if you look deep into your heart and you find that thing that you love most, that same thing, whatever it happens to be, is also your master. So what does that mean? It means, in other words, everyone worships something. Everyone worships something. So you might say, well, what about an atheist? An atheist doesn't worship anything. An atheist doesn't even believe in God. And I will tell you that even an atheist worships something. It's just not God. It's something else. But everyone worships something. What does worship mean? Worship at its essence is ultimate love. I'm going to repeat that. Worship at its essence is is ultimate love. It doesn't have to be through prayer. It doesn't have to be through, you know, supplication. But it's the thing that you ultimately love the most. That's why we have people who worship money. It's not because they've made an idol out of money. It's because money is the most significant thing to that person. That person loves money more than any other thing. And so that person is a mass, is a slave to money. So the question here is, what is it that you love most? What is in your heart, at the core of your heart, and that thing is what becomes your master? Now, why this is so essential is that as we go through life, many people have trouble answering this question. But every single person is driven by that which they love most. So the question now is asking yourself, what is that thing? For those people who have in their hearts, and this is, unfortunately, we live now in a, in a society where we, we're starting to become more and more obsessed over fame and image. How do I appear? See, now with the boom of social media, what's happened is you and I have found a platform where our egos can be on display. Does that make sense? We, we're basically the center. We're the, we're the star. Have you guys, like, you know, when you're little growing up, you're watching, like, a sitcom, and there's, like, a, there's a star of the show, right? And, and maybe growing up you were like, man, why can't I be, a, you know, the star of a show? Now everyone gets to be the star of the show of their life, right? And it's like everything is put on display for an audience, right? Everything, even down to what you ate today. Don't lie, you took a picture of it, right? You know what I'm saying? Everyone, see, it's like you're always being watched. You're always being watched. There's how many thousands of people know what you ate today? Yesterday, the day before, right? Every moment, every movement that we make, we take a photo of it and we post it. For the world to see, right? So there's an, always an audience. Even if it's as significant as I got a haircut, right? My burger had lettuce today, right? These are important enough to tell the world. Now that might seem like, well, what's the big deal? But I'm, I'm talking about something deeper here. What's happening is 
we've started to focus on the wrong things. We've started to focus on our image. We've started to focus on how do I appear. We've started to focus on um, status. You know, there was this, this questionnaire. They asked millennials what their goals were. And the vast majority of them said to be famous. To be famous. And then after that, it was to be rich. So this is actually the old, becomes, it's, it's become such a goal that it's consumed our lives. Now, why, why is that relevant to what we're talking about with regards to the Prophet Sallallahu The reason it's relevant is that whatever you take in your heart and you love most, if that thing is fame, if that thing is image, if that thing is money, if that thing is what other people think, then that's going to be the master that dictates how you live your life. What you do, what you don't do. What you say, what you don't say. So you're no longer living your life for God. You're living your life for people. You're living your life so that people will say. Or, or you're living your life so people won't say. Can we just be real for a second? How many women and maybe men are in extremely dysfunctional marriages and or even abusive marriages and they are told, just stay because what are people going to say? What are people going to say about you if you leave a dysfunction? They're going to say this, this, or that. We've become so obsessed with what people are going to say that we're even willing to have our own children, our own sister, remain in a dysfunctional, even abusive situation just so people won't say. This is a type of worship. This is what happens when we have the wrong focus. The Prophet Sallallahu focus was on Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so his actions were for his pleasure. They weren't for the pleasure of people and they weren't about image and they weren't about even seeking revenge. How many of us find it extremely difficult to forgive? No one, how? Okay, only like one person. Okay, so some people are being honest. Thank you. One person raised their hand. How many of you find it very difficult to forgive? All right. Okay. So let's talk about that. You know, when Aisha radiallahu was accused, and again, before the ayah was revealed, there was a lot of rumors being sp- spread. You hear, you know, you hear a rumor and then what do you do? You spread it. Without verifying, you spread it. So that's what people did. Well, her father, Abu Bakr, found out, radiallahu anh, that one of the people who was spreading this rumor about his own daughter was a relative. And not only was he a relative, but he was a relative that Abu Bakr, radiallahu anh, was financially supporting. Can you imagine that? That one of your relatives who you're helping them out is slandering or spreading slander about your daughter. And so when Abu Bakr al found this out, all he did, he didn't go for revenge. All he did was stop the financial support. Like, that's the least we would do, right? We'd do a little more probably. All he did was stop the financial support. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an ayah for this incident. And in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something that we all have to reflect on. And that is, he says, let them pardon and overlook. This is what's being presented to Abu Bakr. Look at the way their hearts worked. I, I just want you to see how their hearts worked. Allah is saying to him, pardon and overlook. Why? And now this comes to the question of, but... So-and-so doesn't deserve my forgiveness, right? Have you ever felt that way? No? Have you ever felt that way? You know how we keep track? We know what someone did to us on February 1st, 2003. We know what they did at 3 o'clock, right, and 2 minutes. And we, it's almost like we keep a diary. We don't let it go. We keep track of everything that someone's done wrong to us. And then we don't forgive because they don't deserve our forgiveness. 
Maybe they never apologized. Maybe they never even regretted it. This is very difficult to forgive, right? Look at what's happening here. Abu Bakr is being told to pardon and overlook, to forgive. But why? Is it because this man deserved it? Is Allah saying because he apologized? What is Allah saying? It's a completely different focus. Allah says, do you not love for Allah to forgive you? You see? It's a completely, it's a paradigm shift. Where it's not really about Abu Bakr and that relative. It's about Abu Bakr and Allah. It's actually about his own relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and, the, and the question is, do you not love for Allah to forgive you? Do you see the shift? The focus wasn't on the other person. It was on his relationship with Allah. And so because Abu Bakr indeed wanted the forgiveness of Allah, and these were people who were like far beyond us. Because he wanted the forgiveness of Allah, not only did he continue that financial support, he increased it. Why? Because this transaction was between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, it's about focus. Because if you look at it, when you forgive someone who's wronged you, you get something in return that is priceless. You get the forgiveness of Allah. Does that make sense? Let me give you guys an example and then inshallah we'll wrap up and I'll give you a chance inshallah to ask questions. Um, how many of you are like aware of Black Friday deals? Like Black Friday, right? Okay. What happens during Black Friday sales? Well, people act crazy. Okay. Um, what happens during Black Friday sales is that something that maybe a laptop that's normally 1500 will be on sale for say 500 or something. And there'll just be like two of them and Best Buy just wants to bring you into the door with this sale, but there's only two of them. And so then you'll buy something else. That's the, the idea. But my point is what do people do to get a good deal? Well, they do a lot of things. In fact, a lot of times during Black Friday sales, people end up dying. Do you know this? They actually, there's been cases where this lady, she's at Walmart and she's got mace because she wants to get the video game first. I'm not kidding. Another case also happened at Walmart actually. Um, was, and it was in New York, I think. It was a few years back that one of the employees of Walmart actually got trampled because the people needed to get their deal. Like this is the behavior that people, that human beings have to get a good deal, all right? People will stand in line in the freezing cold weather, right? People will do tahajjud and qiyam at the mall, right? Because, because now it's like 2 a.m. Like we will forget sleep. All of a sudden we don't need to sleep. You know what I mean? Like if it was like, if, if someone told you to wake up and pray at that time, it would be hard. But you're at the mall at that time. So why do we act that way? Why do human beings act that way? It's because we as human beings, we like a good deal. We like, we like a good deal. So look at the deal Allah is making. Look at the deal God makes here. If we forgive this person who harmed us, in exchange for that, we get something infinite. So in other words, it's not a $1,500 laptop that's for $500. It's, imagine that there's a house, and it's like on the beach, and it's worth $10 billion. And it's your lucky day. Today it's on sale for a cent. Would you feel like you got a deal? Not so much? Yeah, you'd feel like you got a deal, right? It's kind of like that, except that the house isn't worth $10 billion, It's infinite. So in exchange for something finite, okay, I forgive my, my cousin or my friend or my parents or whoever it is, my, my neighbor, my relative. It's, it's usually a relative, by the way. 
I forgive that person, and in exchange, I get something infinite. So I've gotten something, the value of which isn't $10 billion, it's infinity, and I've gotten it for a cent. Something finite. Okay, I forgive. Now, what does it mean to forgive? Just to clarify, because oftentimes I get this question. Sometimes people think that forgiveness means that you continue to allow that person to abuse you. That's not what forgiveness means. Forgiveness means that in your heart, you forgive, but externally you take action to stop that abuse. Does that make sense? Externally, we are a people of action. I never want to talk about forgiveness and have someone go home and think that it means being a victim. It doesn't. It doesn't mean turning the other cheek. That's not what it means. Because turning the other cheek means you've abused me and I'm going to let you keep doing it. But that's not Islamic. The Prophet said, if you see something wrong, try to change it with your hand. And if you cannot, then with your tongue. This is speaking out against it. And if you cannot, then at least hate it in your heart. And this is the weakest of faith. So it's an active religion. It's not passive. But at the same time, while I am taking action against that injustice and making sure to the best of my ability that it does not happen again, internally I am forgiving. أخولين قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه غفور رحيم سبحانك الله بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك. We have a few minutes now for questions. Okay, yes. Is there a mic or should I? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. We talked about like forgiving others, but when it comes to forgiving yourself, how do you go about that journey? Thank you for asking that. Um, that, is, that, is a, that is such an important question. Uh, on that, I'm going to say this. Um, oftentimes, we are so hard on ourselves, way harder than we are on others. And that's a problem. And the reason that, and this is what I want to point out, every human being is created imperfect. This wasn't a flaw in the, in the divine design. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a mistake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't make mistakes. So the fact that Allah made the human being, you know, fallible and imperfect is by design. So that's the first thing I want to establish. We make the mistake, and this brings me full circle to my first point, we make the mistake of thinking that for something to be good, it has to be flawless. And I repeat that, because this is deep. We think that for something to be good, it has to be flawless. Or for something to be good, it has to be perfect. And that's, a fl that's actually a myth. And it becomes, a, it becomes self-sabotaging. Because we think that, and this is why we turn our heroes into superhuman. Because we say if they're good, they must have been superhuman. If they're good, they must be perfect. You know, we, we, we turn our leaders into celebrities. And we think that they're perfect, right? We don't want to look at them as human. Because we have this idea that to be good means to be perfect, right? Religious people. We think that religious people, to be religious, you have to be perfect, to be religious, you have to be perfect. That's why we have all these myths. For example, um, I'm not going to put on hijab until first I become an angel. You know what I'm saying? I'm not ready to start praying until first I reach this state of, I don't know, nirvana or something. You know? Like I have to, I have to first be perfect and then I can start to practice or then I can start being a good Muslim but first I have to be an angel there's this idea that to be a good Muslim you have to become an angel I'll tell you right now no one transformed into an angel first and then the next day put on hijab the hijab is not a crown that says by the way last night yep I got wings that's not what hijab means and this is this is a problem so we you know hijab is simply one of many acts of worship saying, I'm trying. 
I'm trying. And I'm doing my best. And Ya Allah, I'm trying. And that's what Allah wants from us. In fact, the dua that we're taught by the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, it's called Sayyidul Istighfar, which means it's the best dua, the master of the supplications for repentance. And do you know what it says? It says, Allahumma anta rabbi, la ilaha illa ant, khalaqtani wa ana abduk, wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'adika mastata'at. You're saying to Allah, I'm doing my best. Like I'm, I'm on your covenant, I'm doing the best I can as much as I can. You're not coming to Allah and saying, I became perfect, ya Allah, so reward me now. You're not doing that. You're admitting to Allah, Abu Ulaka. Like it's all just you admitting that you're imperfect. So what, how does that bring me to the fact that we can't forgive ourselves? It's because we don't give ourselves permission to be human. We don't give ourselves permission to be human. We expect perfection from ourselves and from others. This is why we can't forgive others and this is why we can't forgive ourselves. It's because I expect, no, I'm not allowed to make mistakes. I have to be perfect. And then when we make a mistake, we take out the whip and we whip ourselves. And that's, it's just um, extremely toxic. It's extremely toxic. If Allah can forgive you, then why can't you forgive you? Right? You know, there's this quote, it's like a C.S. Lewis quote, beautiful quote. He's one of the few people I follow on Twitter. <laughs> I know he's dead, but his quotes. Um, C.S. Lewis says something to the effect of when we, when we refuse to forgive ourselves, we're setting up a tribunal even, great, even higher than God's. It's almost like we're putting, our, it's like we're, we're putting a court that's higher than God's court. Because God forgives. Allah says that he can forgive all sins. All sins. He says if you come to me with sins as high as the sky, and you, are, and you don't associate a partner with me, and you seek my forgiveness... I'll give you forgiveness as great as that. That's Allah. But then we come and say, no, actually, my court is higher than Allah's court. I won't forgive myself. You know what I mean? Any other questions? While they're giving the mic, I just want to add something to that point, and that is the negative self-talk that we engage in. It's absolute poison. See this bottle right here? It has spring water in it. Spring water is wonderful. But imagine that this bottle was full of poison and I was just sipping on it. What's going to happen to me? Anyone? Any doctors in the room? Yeah, I'm going to slowly kill myself, right? That's what we do with our negative self-talk. When we, the way we talk to ourselves is like sipping poison sometimes. When we say things like, you know, you're such a failure, you'll never get it right, you're always messing up, you're fat, you know what I'm saying? It's like we're constantly beating ourselves up, and that's like sipping poison. You're actually destroying yourself, it's toxic. We have to stop doing that, and we have to be more compassionate with ourselves, and we have to be able to um, give ourselves permission to be human. Um, I was just wondering, how can you build confidence within yourself as a person? Um, if that, you could talk about that. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a couple, couple answers to that question. Um, I'll give you a conceptual answer, and then I'll give you a practical answer. Uh, okay. So conceptually, you become more confident when the definition of your self-worth is only linked, is linked to your relationship with God. When the definition of your self-worth is linked to your relationship with God. Instead of it being linked to something else like how you look, how, you, how thin you are, how powerful you are, how much money you have. When your self-worth is linked to anything other than your relationship with Allah, you'll never be able to be very confident. Because what will happen is, sometimes 
you'll be up, sometimes you'll be down, depending on, you know, when, when people like you, maybe then you'll feel good. But as soon as they don't like you, you don't feel good anymore, right? Maybe when you look a certain way, you feel fine. But when you don't look that way, you don't feel okay about yourself. So your self-worth is being linked to something unstable and something that isn't actually significant. So it's really about what defines your self-worth. And of course, right now, our society right now defines especially women's self-worth on appearances. And now that leads me to the next point, which is practical. One thing I warn you about is the Instagram culture. I'll explain that. The problem with the Instagram culture is that everyone becomes obsessed with appearances. And it's all about comparing yourself to others. And you're not comparing yourself to others in taqwa, right? Right? It's not, it's not that kind of competition in like running to Allah. It's a competition in who looks better, in who's more fashionable, in who can contour better their face, right? So the idea is, or, or, or how you wrap your hijab, or how, you know, how thin you are, what size do you wear, like, how, how nice is your skin? And of course, there's a filter for it if it ain't nice. So what happens is you're constantly comparing yourself on this criteria of appearances. And that is one of the most toxic things to self-confidence. It really is. There's studies that show that the more people consume of social media, the more they get depressed. It's, it's not difficult to understand why. So practically, I'll give you guys, I'll give you, try an experiment. Detox from social media for a certain period of time and see how you feel about yourself. I'm serious. Just, just that, just that. And then if you decide to come back to the Instagram world and the, the whole world, change your newsfeed. Just change it. Here's, here's how I want you to think about your newsfeed, right? Your newsfeed is like your fridge. Whatever's in the fridge is what you're going to eat that day. If your fridge is full of poison, molded cheesecake, old bread, I'm sorry, but that's what you're going to eat that day. And your newsfeed, that's the problem. What's on your newsfeed? You're going to eat that. That's what you're going to ingest. Whatever you look at whatever you listen to these are all input that's all input into the, into the soul into the heart so what you have to do is look at the quality of your fridge <laughs> what do you got in there is it poison or is it organic right is it like healthy food so what i would say is change the contents of your newsfeed maybe it doesn't have to be following what a celebrity is eating for breakfast or what she's wearing that day or he's doing or he's who he's with whatever or or we have the muslim versions of celebrities too we have the muslim version and i'm not talking about haram and halal here i'm not up here to talk i'm not even qualified to talk about that i'm not saying it's haram or halal to be doing these like to to, to have that be your profession, for example. That's not the point. My point is, what's your focus? And if your focus is just on how someone looks, what's in fashion, you know? If that, and, and it's just constant images of these, of just appearances, appearances, appearances. What's happening is that becomes the most important thing to you. And it leads to a lot of insecurity. You, you, you lose self-confidence. Because at the end of the day, guess what? <laughs> You're comparing your real body to a filtered one. In other words, actually not just filtered, but you're comparing yourself to a photoshopped one. It's not, it's not real. So it's like you're just setting yourself up to, to constantly feel bad about yourself. 
and um, it isn't healthy, and, and it's really not what matters. It's just not what matters. So it's really about using these things to enrich you. I mean, you have, there's everything on social media. You can choose whatever you want. You can use online, I mean, you can use the internet for a lot of good, or you can use it for a lot of harm. So this is actually a follow-up question to the first question that someone asked about um, forgiving yourself. So let's say if we agree that we're not perfect and we agree that we're going to embrace ourselves and embrace our mistakes. So uh, we still want to get better, though. We still want yes. to uh, not be complacent and be uh, in constant progress, right? How can you balance between... Um, yeah, between the two, between becoming better and constantly improving yourself and also at the same time embracing your mistakes. Okay, anyway. thank you for bringing that up because it allows me to clarify. As I mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? He says, if you come to me associating no partners with me, even if your sins fill the area between the heavens and the earth and you come sincerely to me and, re and, and repent and seek my forgiveness... I will forgive you. I'll give you forgiveness as great as that. So there is an action that we have to take. Yes, you're absolutely right. But the point I was making is that the Prophet ﷺ said in a sound hadith, all the children of Adam are going to make mistakes. They're fallible. And the best of them are who? Those who repent. So it's really about, yes, constantly trying to better yourself. It's about when you stumble, you get back up, you, tr you, f you, you repent, and you keep going. You, you, you stumble again, you get back up, you repent, and you keep going. So you are constantly trying to re re renew yourself. You know, it's, it's a, what it is, is it's a constant path of tezkiah. Tezkiah means to purify. So you're always trying to purify and develop yourself. But the mistake is that as soon as you fall or you falter, you just give up. I mean, I've heard people saying things like, you know, I might as well take off my hijab. I might as well just stop, you know, uh, being involved with the masjid. I might as well, all them people, they're just so judgmental. You know, I might as well just stop praying. These are, these are tricks of, 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 of how we deceive ourselves into just losing hope. And so that's what we have to be careful about. But yes, we have to keep trying. And we have to keep better, trying to better ourselves. But that's never going to happen if we lose hope. And we despair every time we make a mistake. So it's, it's really about f allowing ourselves to be human. But, but at the same time, we're told to strive for something called ihsan. What's ihsan? People often translate as perfection, but perfection is only for Allah. Ihsan is excellence. It means that you do the absolute best that you can to have beautiful conduct, to have excellence in what you're doing. So yes, we are supposed to strive for excellence, but that's not the same thing as perfection. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. How are you? <laughs> My question, um, I wanted to ask, What's your advice when it comes to having good friendships with good people and breaking off friendships with people who just bring you down and have a bad influence on you? Like, how do you respectfully break off of those kind of people? Um, the importance of good friendship can't be overstated. The Prophet ﷺ told us that al mar'u ala dini khalili which means that a person will be on the way of life of his or her closest friend. So you actually become like your friend. When you take someone as a close companion, you start to become like each other. You take on the same way, the same deen, literally the way of life. He also said that good company is like entering a perfume shop. See what happens when you enter what happens when you enter Bath and Body Works, right? You go in there and even if you buy nothing, you come out smelling like, you know, perfume and apple, cucumber. You you put on all the samples, right? So you come out smelling better anytime you go in a perfume shop. Even if you don't buy anything, 
it still affects you in a positive way. You, you smell better than you, you did when you went in, right? So good company, he says, is like entering a perfume shop. Even if you don't get, come out with something, you'll still ha- smell better. And, this, and then the opposite is true. Bad company is like entering a blacksmith shop. You either get burnt or you come out with the smell of smoke on your clothing. So it still affects you at the very least, is just the way you smell. We have to be very mindful who we take as our closest companions because on the Day of Judgment, Allah tells us in the Qur'an that the people who are being punished are going to say, I wish I had not taken so-and-so as a close friend. I wish I had not taken so-and-so as a friend because that person misguided me. To the, that person took me to the wrong path. They took me away from the path, the, the, the straight path. So this is one of the biggest regrets that people have in Jahannam. So this is extremely important. It, and, and, and in fact, scholars of the heart say that bad company is one of the poisons of the heart. So it's, it's extremely important that we, we, we guard our com- company. I know the next question, what it's going to be, but I mean, this is a whole subject, is going to be, well, what if we can't avoid it? Right? What if that person's in my family? What if that person's working next to me in my, you know, in at work? Well, the answer to that question is you do what you can to avoid toxicity. All right? So for example, I'm not gonna go next to radiation on purpose. And if I know that there's an area where there's radiation, I'm going to stay clear of it. Yes? You guys aren't don't seem sure. Yes. Engagement. Yes. Yes. Okay. I should have given my body language spiel at the beginning. Like, yes. Okay. You're going to stay as far away from that radiation as you possibly can, right? You're going to do whatever you can to stay away. But now imagine that you have to work at a nuclear power plant. That's like you have no choice. So then what do you do? Anyone? You wear protection. Right? Yeah? That's the same thing spiritually. You try what you can to take toxicity out of your life. And if you can't completely take it out of your life, at least distance yourself from toxicity. Okay? And if you can't even do that, then at least wear your shield, your radioactive protection. And what is that? It is the remembrance of Allah. Like literally the remembrance of Allah is, is like a shield. What, what does it mean to remember Allah? Well, three parts that, that, that I always get, talk about with the dhikr, the dhikr practice, daily remembrance. First is the salah. The fact that you, you pray five times a day on time. That's the oxygen of the heart. If you're not praying, you're not breathing. And there's, there's no two ways about that. There's no way that you're going to be successful spiritually if you're not praying. Because that's like saying that someone's going to be successful and they're not breathing. So salah. And then second is the adhkar. How many people have heard of the book Fortress of a Muslim? So Fortress of a Muslim is just a collection of supplications from the Quran and from the Sunnah, from the Prophet Um, Incorporating that in your daily life, that is a shield. That's why it's called Fortress of a Muslim. It's a shield. Um, it protects you from all types of harm, by the way. All types of harm, including the, the toxicity of people. And especially morning supplications, evening supplications, and supplications before you sleep. There's supplications after prayer as well. And one note to, to, to keep in mind here is that something small is better than nothing. Keep that in mind. This is a principle. Uh, uh, one spiritual principle that we're taught by the Prophet Sallallahu is that Allah loves the actions that are consistent, even if they're small. So even if you can just say a couple of these supplications, but you're consistent, then that will be extremely effective, even if it's small. And then third, in this dhikr like prescription, is the Qur'an, is being connected to the Qur'an regularly, daily. It doesn't have to be a juz a day, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a huge amount, but even if it's a small amount, but you're doing it consistently, that will be like a shield, okay? 
So that's basically what it is, is that you, you try to distance yourself as much as you can, and you wear your shield, salah, adhkar, and uh, Qur'an. And with regards to the Qur'an, and I usually advise this, this is an app that I use, it's called My Dua, M-Y-D-U-A-A. And this is an app form of Fortress of a Muslim. So you have it on your phone, you can star certain ones, and that becomes your treasure chest. You say them every single day, and they are powerful, very powerful. Before I wrap up, I just have a couple announcements. Um, so a couple people asked me, I do have copies of both of my books. I know they mentioned uh, Reclaim Your Heart. I also have a new book. It's called Love and Happiness. And I also have the new edition of Reclaim Your Heart. The new edition uh, has four new chapters. And just to kind of tell you a little bit about my books, um, what I... <laughs> What I wrote about in Reclaim Your Heart and Love and Happiness is that as I was kind of going through my own life, I was going through stuff and I was learning along the way and I was sharing that. Um, Reclaim Your Heart is a book about uh, this concept of the fact that we give our hearts away to dunya. We give our hearts away to money. We give our hearts away to our careers. We give our hearts away to status, power, you know, our egos. And it's about taking your heart back and giving it to its rightful owner, which is God. Uh, so this concept, and it, and it just talks about how to live in this life um, without kind of getting consumed by this life. A lot of people have found it especially helpful during times of, of loss and difficulty. Um, but it also, I think it's one of the best uh, premarital books um, you can give someone. Because I think it gives a lot of people perspective of, of how to have... A healthy attachment um, with 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 your spouse and and with the creation generally. It, it talks about that. Um, also, another uh, point I want to share is both me and my husband were both very um, we we were very passionate about trying to help uh, the community with regards to coaching. Um, the problem that we've seen throughout our travels is that there is a lot of stigma within the Muslim community, uh, especially when it comes to asking for help. So when people are suffering, whether they're suffering from mental health issues or um, they're suffering in their marriages, a lot of times we don't feel like we can ask for help. There's a stigma, people feel ashamed, or maybe people don't know where to go. So if you are um, you know, looking for help or you're, you're interested in, in, looking, in getting counseling or coaching, uh, inshallah you can speak to my husband uh, during the book signing or myself. And, and inshallah we can try our best to help. Aqulni qawli hadha wa astaghfir Allah li wa lakum inna ghafurun rahim subhanakallahu bihamdak ashadun la ilaha illa ant astaghfiraku wa atubu laik wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.